In 1868, the 14th Amendment was ratified, ending slavery by giving all Americans citizenship. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the states wherein they reside. United States Code and Innate Amendment 14. However, what the public was not told, that while under the Lieber Code, a 14th Amendment citizen can only be found within the jurisdiction of the United States. That is, all government employees, all those who live in territories occupied by the federal government, such as Washington, D.C., and the former slaves. The rest of the population was not subject to the 14th Amendment, and thus could still claim jurisdiction under the original Constitution. In addition to that, after the conclusion of the Civil War, the federal government was now occupying the southern states, placing these captured citizens under the jurisdiction of the Libra Code. The southern states had to agree to ratify this amendment in order for them to be granted their freedom from federal rule. Thus, instead of ending slavery, the 14th Amendment held all southerners captive as slaves in the plantation known as the United States of America. Just like how all citizens were turned into corporations in 1790 to subject them to the Revolutionary War debts, 14th Amendment citizens were created to be franchisees subject to the corporation known as the United States Incorporated. And like all corporate brands, you do not have any Constitutional Bill of Rights protections. Proof of such can be found in the all-caps version of your name, which signifies a corporate entity. After the Civil War, the United States defaulted on its war debt. During the bankruptcy proceedings, cunning lawyers in league with international bankers found a loophole within Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17 of the United States Constitution, which allowed the creation of a duplicate entity known as the Corporation of the United States of America to replace the now bankrupt and defunct Republic of the United States of America. This occurred with the passage of the District of Columbia Organic Act of 1871, which incorporated the area of the District of Columbia into a private foreign corporation chartered in the city of London known as the United States Incorporated. This corporation designated Congress as the Board of Directors to continue the business needs of the government under martial law. Thanks to the Lieber Code, federal jurisdiction under the Organic Act was expanded to include not only all captured citizens in the southern states, but all Americans in all states. Thus, America had lost her sovereignty under the yoke of the Crown of England and the international bankers. During this same time, the Corporation of the United States adopted its own constitution, which was identical to the original national constitution. To fool the people, one word was changed from its original form, the Constitution for the United States of America, to its present day all capitalized form, which signifies a corporate entity, the Constitution of the United States of America. Incidentally, the Titles of Nobility Amendment was removed from this new Constitution. With the Illuminati in full control over the United States, they now sought to rule the world. After the death of Adam Weishaupt in 1830, Giuseppe Mazzini was selected to head the Illuminati. In 1871, the mental power was passed on again to the American General Albert Pike as its new director. Pike became fascinated with the idea of a one-world government and eventually constructed the Illuminati's blueprint of world domination. His plans called for the financing of three world wars in the 20th century. The First War would bring about an atheist communist state from the ashes of Tsarist Russia. The Second War would bring about a Jewish Holocaust under a fascist government to ferment support of a Zionist state of Israel. The Third War would manipulate the differences of Christians and Muslims for their own annihilation. Then finally, political Zionism would come out as victors of all. These three world wars would require enormous funding since most of the royalty in Europe was already deeply in debt thanks to the numerous wars and conflicts created by the Rothschild banking dynasty, the only place left that could possibly pay for such ambitious plans was the now prosperous American Republic. After the Civil War, the United States went through a great industrial expansion. The new industries of oil, steel, textile, and railroad all needed generous financing, which the Rothschild family was more than eager to provide. To access these markets, the Rothschilds sent their agent, Jacob Schiff, to infiltrate the New York banking scene, which was controlled by J.P. Morgan. 
By the turn of the century, the Rothschilds had fully entrenched themselves into the tight fraternity of Wall Street banks, such as Goldman Sachs and Lehman Brothers. They now sought their most prized possession, full control over the American monetary system. With help from Jacob Schiff and J.P. Morgan, the Rothschilds formed a scheme which would seduce Congress into relinquishing control over the money supply. This occurred with the Panic of 1907, when a liquidity crisis caused many banks and businesses to fail all across the United States. The meltdown began when J.P. Morgan published rumors that the Knickerbocker Trust Company of New York was insolvent. With a bank run on hand, they were forced to call in their loans, creating a chain reaction which would threaten to implode the entire banking system. The failures continued until J.P. Morgan and Company provided a generous loan to the insolvent banks. But J.P. Morgan was not trying to save the American banking system, but rather, he used the crisis to destroy his competition by choosing which banks he would bail out. But the biggest casualty of the economic fallout was the looming bankruptcy of the Corporation of the United States, which had no means to pay back their loans, which were due in 1912. In anticipation of this bankruptcy, representatives from the world's most powerful families met in November 1910 at a secret meeting at the Jekyll Island Club Resort in Georgia to discuss the foreclosure of the Corporation of the United States and to brainstorm solutions which would prevent future liquidity crises such as occurred during the Panic of 1907. Those in attendance included Senator Nelson Aldrich, Paul Warburg, representatives from J.P. Morgan and Company, and Jacob Schiff, representing the Rothschild family. They proposed a 20-year extension on the national debt if the United States would agree to charter a privately owned central bank, which would serve as a bank of last resort by lending money to other insolvent banks in order to prevent future bank runs. A week later, they emerged with their plans to create what is known as the Federal Reserve System. Because the current President Taft would never agree to sign away the American monetary system to a cabal of international bankers, they waited until they got their man, the progressive Woodrow Wilson, into power. In return for the bankers' generous campaign contributions, Woodrow Wilson reluctantly promised the bankers he would sign the Federal Reserve Act if he was elected into office. Many powerful forces were opposed to the creation of a privately controlled central bank. To neutralize this threat, J.P. Morgan invited the major opponents of the Federal Reserve Act on board the maiden voyage of the newly built Titanic luxury steam liner built by the White Star Line, owned by J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan ordered the captain to steer his ship into an iceberg, and under gunpoint prevented the men from escaping onto the lifeboats, killing many of his enemies in one large swoop. When word of this got back to Woodrow Wilson, he commented, There exists this power in the world, so subtle, so organized, so watchful, that we dare not speak above a whisper when we speak in condimentation of it. At the beginning of 1913, the United States had defaulted on its debt. After being denied a new line of credit, the now President Woodrow Wilson faced a constitutional crisis. With no other sources of funding, he went along with the banker schemes engineered at the Jekyll Island Resort. To avoid any opposition, Senator Nelson Aldrich quickly pushed the Federal Reserve Act through both houses of Congress. On December 23, 1913, while most of Congress was away on Christmas vacation, a quorum call was issued. A few selected congressional traders voted by voice to avoid public record and pass the Federal Reserve Act, which President Wilson signed into law. Wilson later admitted with remorse when referring to the Fed, I have unwittingly ruined my country. This act gave away the keys of the printing presses at the U.S. Treasury to a foreign corporation chartered under the Crown of England known as the Federal Reserve Bank. The Federal Reserve was created by Congress in 1913 and it was entrusted with the power granted originally to the Congress by the U.S. Constitution to coin money and regulate the value thereof. The Federal Reserve Bank advertises itself as a non-profit corporation that operates as if it's another branch of the government. However, its board members are unelected and their meetings are conducted behind the closed doors away from public scrutiny. The board of directors of the Federal Reserve System is chosen by the president from a list prepared by the bankers themselves. It's important that whomever I pick uh, 
is viewed as an independent person from politics. All this secrecy becomes very suspicious considering how the Federal Reserve monitors and controls trillions of dollars within the world's banking system. After the federal government lost its ability to issue its own money, the national debt soon soared to astronomical heights because now the government had to pay the Federal Reserve interest on all its currency printed to circulation. But this interest on the national debt could never be repaid as the Federal Reserve required all debts to be repaid with gold which the government did not have. And even worse, the interest portion of the national debt was not issued into the money supply. In other words, more and more debt would have to be issued to continue servicing the growing interest payments on all loans. In order to cover this interest payment, Congress was forced to pass the income tax legislation, which became law in 1913 with the ratification of the 16th Amendment, also known as the Income Tax Amendment. Initially, they levied a 1% voluntary tax on all incomes over 3000 and a progressive surtax on all incomes over 20000 but this would soon increase with the outbreak of World War I and World War II. Income tax allowed the Federal Reserve System to confiscate the earnings of the common man, but the industrialists and financiers were exempted from paying any income tax because they could afford to hide their assets in tax-free foundations which they claim were devoted to philanthropy. Examples of such include the Rockefeller Foundation, the Mellon Foundation, and the Carnegie Endowment. The main purpose of the income tax is not to raise revenue, but to redistribute wealth and to control society. Technically, the 16th Amendment was not ratified by the necessary states as it violates the constitutional clause of no direct taxes. Despite this, Congress went ahead and taxed the people anyway. The government was able to do this because under their corporate charter, Congress was operating as the board of directors and therefore they had the authority to enter this amendment as ratified. But remember, this amendment has nothing to do with the original United States Constitution, which was replaced back in 1871 with the corporate constitution. It's actually very simple. Congress tried to enact an income tax in 1894. The Supreme Court said that's unconstitutional. When the Supreme Court says something is unconstitutional, it's unconstitutional. They tried again in 1913, and the Supreme Court said the 16th Amendment conferred no new power of taxation. So if they didn't have it then, and they didn't get it, they don't have it. There is no constitutional basis for a tax on the wages of Americans living and working in the 50 states of the Union. Period. End of argument.